And so we're going to start off uh, here with a, an update from Case Cook on the, uh, the Colonel Self-Protection Project, which uh, got a kind of formalised start last year at the Colonel Summit. Uh, Case gave an overview and pre presented a whole bunch of uh, information to the core kernel developers um, and the aim has been to try and uh, bring some of the out of tree code and ideas uh, for hardening the kernel uh, into Linux and there's a number of uh, technical and political, social, psychological, <laughs> psychiatric <laughs> issues to deal with in, in all of this so uh, and Case has taken that on so I'll hand it over to him. Cool, thanks. Um, I have a bunch of slides, some of them are pretty dense, uh, so if you want to look at this stuff offline or along with me now, it's uh, at that URL, it'll be at the end again too. Um, but yeah, this is the status of uh, the kernel self-protection. So this is quickly, this is about the Linux kernel, obviously, and uh, here's our agenda about what we're going to be covering. I'm going to do some sort of rationale for why we're doing this, um, and then who's gotten involved, what we've done, other stuff we're looking at doing, uh, and the challenges that we faced. Um, uh, a lot of these things apply to sort of general software ecosystem, but this is very specific to Linux kernel. Um, and I'll just blaze ahead. So this is the Linux Security Summit. Security is a pretty loaded word. It covers a lot of areas. Um, and for the context of this presentation, I'm talking about things beyond access control, beyond attack surface reduction, um, beyond bug fixing, um, beyond protecting user space, and even, you know, it can be argued this is even beyond simple kernel integrity. This is about self-protection technologies, which is, you know, proactive systems in the kernel to stop attacks. Um, a lot of that's wrapped up in kernel integrity. Um, but this is, this is about uh, th those pieces of self-protection of the kernel itself as opposed to things that the kernel do, do uh, the kernel implements to protect user space. Um, and then why are we doing this? I mean, probably I don't need to cover this with most of the people here, but um, there's a ton of stuff using Linux. Um, we're over a billion devices on, on Android. I mean, it's, it's got a huge penetration. Um, and then I'll, I'm gonna come back to this point, but the vast majority of these devices are running effectively old software. Um, they're out in the world, they're, they're running old stuff, and they may or may not receive patches, um, so fixing bugs won't necessarily help those devices. You know, as we move forward, we need devices that are actually protecting themselves uh, a little bit more uh, than they are now. Um, because the lifetime of bugs that are discovered are even longer for devices that are out in the field uh, because they're dependent on vendors actually issuing the bug fixes to the, to the, to the um, release devices. So even if upstream says, oh sure, we found that bug, we fixed it. Like, okay, but what kernel version was it fixed in? Did it end up in a stable release? Did a vendor backport it? Did the carrier for the phone take that update from the vendor and push it out to phones? There's a very long lifetime, uh, potentially. Um, and this is becoming an even greater problem with you know, Internet of Things stuff where maybe you have your phone and you've had it for three years and you're like, wow, this phone's getting really old. Um, and compared to servers, that's kind of crazy. But with IoT, you're like, well, I installed, I installed this thing in my door lock I'm probably just gonna leave it there for the next 15 years. We end up with very long device lifetimes. Um, and I hear a lot, of, a lot of sort of blame shifting about where this problem needs to be solved. You know, upstream developers are like, well, we've done everything we can. We have the bug is, you know, the bug is fixed. It's on, on to someone else to make sure it's rolled out. And then the people um, who've rolled out, the, you know, the vendors are saying, well, but the, you know, we can't get it out to these devices because they're not coming online, or you know, there's a lots of different things uh, about that. So the idea is to build in the protection technologies from the start, and when a bug comes along, we don't really care. Um, so getting into this a little bit more, uh, in 2010, John Corbett 
wanted to answer a similar question about you know how long are these bugs really in in the upstream kernel? Um, what kind of lifetimes are we talking about? Are bugs in there for a couple months? Are they in there for a couple years? And in 2010, he went back and looked through a lot of the the CVE uh, you know bugs that were associated with the CVE, and saw that on average it took about five years for a bug to get fixed. So it'd be introduced at some point, and then five years would go by before it was discovered and or fixed, um, which seemed huge. And I thought, well, we should probably take a look and see if you know, we've done such a good job with doing you know, static analysis and trying to do all these tools for bug hunting. Um, so I looked through the Ubuntu CV tracker, which has done a lot of the work already in trying to figure out where things were introduced versus where they were fixed so I can actually calculate bug lifetimes. And so for, from 2011 forward, we're still seeing, except for really critical stuff, um, we're still seeing this about five year lifetime. Um, although the stuff that's sort of marked as a high, a high priority issue is starting to grow into even longer lifetimes. Um, and this, this summary is just a bunch of numbers and I didn't like just putting this slide up. So I tried to visualize what we're looking at here. So this is uh, 557 bugs that are associated with the CVE. Um, red, which you can barely see here, thankfully, uh, are the critical bugs and then orange are high priority bugs, blue, medium, and low. Um, the most recent kernel is at the top and the start of Git history is at the bottom, so you can see the lifetime as it stretches from where it was introduced all the way to where it gets fixed. Um, generally, a lot of the stuff under medium and low tend to be very specific problems or theoretical issues that don't really get hit, so we can zoom in and look just at critical and high, um, and we've still got giant bug lifetimes. Um, even on critical, you know, this is from before 2011, I'm not sure when 2.6.31 came out, but it wasn't fixed until 3.14. So if you happen to release software that depended on any of these kernel versions in between there, you're running with a critical bug. I sure hope you've patched it. Um, that that kind of sucks. Um, a question I get a lot is, well, okay, isn't this just theoretical? You know, no one's actually finding these bugs to begin with, so they're not actually, you know, there's no window of opportunity. Um, and that's, you know, demonstrably false. Uh, people are finding, people are finding these bugs uh, sometimes immediately when they're introduced. Um, this is a link to some uh, some folks that found uh, one of the one of the critical bugs and you know boasted that they found it when it was introduced and they used it for like two years before it was fixed in upstream. But um, most attackers, most of the people that we're interested in, in protecting ourselves from are not publicly boasting about the bugs they're finding. Um, so we, we have you know, a couple data points about this, but it's you know, this lifetime, this window of opportunity for attack is still large and it's not theoretical because we can actually, we've actually seen demonstrations. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, we're, we're definitely fighting bugs. We're, fi we're using static checkers, using dynamic checkers. Uh, we're fixing them but we're also accelerating the pace uh, that we introduce bugs. So we're kind of uh, uh, on level. Um, and another thing that, uh, that I try to convince people of is that the bugs exist whether we know about them or not. Uh, this seems to be a, a big thing that people, for some reason, just can't accept mentally. You know, like, well, I have no open bugs in my bug tracker. Everything's fine. It's like, yeah, but, you know, when, um, go back to, to this. So from 2.6.32 until, you know, 3.13, everything was fine with a critical bug sitting on your system. So the important thing, to, you know, the important thing to think about is sort of look at where things were introduced and try to gauge how many high priority and critical bugs exist now in the software you are running today. And to accept the fact that we, we as a community don't know about it yet, but they're there. Um, so it's important for us to act like there are bugs because they are there. So we have to 
create systems that expect bugs to be present. Um, and that ultimately, you know, whack-a-mole is not a solution in the long term. We do want good, you know, to have good clean code, so I'm not, I'm not saying we need to stop doing all the bug finding we're already doing. Um, last year uh, was uh, the keynote gave a sort of a comparison to um, the software ecosystem generally in the 1960s car industry where uh, cars were designed to run but not to fail. So it was very comfortable while you're going down the road, uh, but as soon as you crashed, everyone died. Um, so that's not, that's not acceptable anymore. Like we laugh at it now and, and it's like cars are designed with all these safety features. Um, and in a similar fashion, um, Linux kernel needs to deal with attacks in a manner where it actually is expecting them and actually handles uh, gracefully in some fashion uh, the fact that it's being uh, attacked. Um, and this is becoming more and more of an issue because over time, user space is actually becoming more and more difficult uh, to attack. There's a lot of access control and, and other you know, uh, approaches being used in user space. And that kernel layer is now one of the largest exposed attack surfaces uh, generally. And containers um, have put kind of an even bigger target on the kernel because you've got you know, how many different user spaces all running on one kernel. So that makes the kernel even more interesting to attack uh, because you can jump around and do other things. Um, and a thing I have also tried to remind people, although not too much because it becomes upsetting, is that um, you know, it's, not, it's, it's literal that lives depend on Linux and not just in the fact of how, how the software is being used, but you end up with situations where you know, there was, I think it was one of the higher critical bugs, uh, the, the Futex kernel bug from a little while ago was turned into uh, a tool called Talroot that was used to, you know, root your Android phones or whatever. But when the, the Black Hat organization, the hacking team was exposed and the, all their tool sets were seen uh, for the world, it was noticed that Talroot was sort of reorganized again to be a weapon for that group. So that means if you're a dissident, an activist somewhere else in the world, and you're getting spied on, um, you know, your life is literally at risk because of these bugs. And that's, that's a bit heavy, but uh, it's kind of true, and it's something to keep in the back of your mind uh, about how these things uh, affect people in the real world. Um, I, like, I like this photo. This is a picture of a, of a 1959 Bel Air crashing into a 2009 Chevy Malibu, where the 59 is just being utterly decimated. The entire front end and cabin uh, passenger compartment is destroyed. And the Chevy, you can sort of see the person or the test dummy in there, but the whole cabin is okay. So it's like, this is what we want to get to in our comparison from you know, 60s car in, in, uh, industry to current and current software ecosystems and Linux in general. We want to make it much more survivable. Um, anyway, so as I've talked about, uh, killing bugs is nice, um, but there is some truth in the complaint that, well, security bugs are just normal bugs. It's like, yeah, some things are, you know, a bug, a security bug to me, but not to you, but that's even more of a reason to have proactive systems in place because then we don't care what the classification is. Um, there, it's not a security issue at all. Um, and in dealing with uh, how to accept responsibility for code that is running on devices that isn't in upstream, if we can create proactive systems that work even with un-upstream software, that's good because that's still the device someone is holding is this, you know, this consolidation of code that's upstream and not upstream. And if we can make it safer, regardless of where the code comes from, that's good. Um, since we can't necessarily fix the bugs in out of stream, uh, out of tree code. Um, so again, it's, we can't say it's not our problem. Um, but I want to kill bug classes. Uh, if we can stop an entire class of bug from happening, that would be best. Uh, make it so that out of tree code can't even hit these kinds of bugs. But we'll never kill all of them. So we want to kill exploitation methods. Um, want to look at how attacks are performed, what can we do to frustrate those attacks or 
totally make them impossible to, to start. Um, and the thing I try to convince uh, a lot of developers about is we need to introduce these features even when it makes development more difficult. Um, there, is a, you know, there is a technical burden to supporting these kinds of features, but it's similar, you know, it's, the analogy falls apart eventually, but even with the car industry, they have to work around the fact that, you know, okay, we've got these titanium bars in the side doors now, and can I put the window there now? Okay, no, I have to work around that, but I have to work around that because those, those reinforcements are in fact important for running the safety of the vehicle. Um, and we're sort of in the same place here. It's like, okay, we want to make it as easy as possible, but there are going to be situations where there's going to be a trade-off to maintainability, or there's going to be a trade-off to performance, or these other things, and we have to sort of accept that that is part of the development process. Uh, it's not just uh, a thing to be avoided at all costs. So when looking at, at how we can defend the kernel, there's sort of uh, areas of dealing with, with typical exploits, um, and this uncovers where we want to focus our, our protections. Um, usually modern attacks are not just one bug and suddenly everything comes apart, it's usually a, a series of bugs. So anytime we can close individual bugs, we can break chains of attack. Um, but ultimately, we need to know where the targets are. Um, you know, as an attacker, you need to know where the target is, somehow to inject uh, what you want or find uh, code that you want to, to run, locate that code and redirect your execution. So anything we can interrupt in each of those pieces um, is important. Uh, and at which point someone says, okay, so this is a big problem, what do we do? Um, the Washington Post had a nice article around this which um, helped launch this self-protection project a bit, like it was being worked on in pieces before that. Um, but a lot of this code already exists. Um, there, it's either in out-of-tree uh, out repositories like PAX and GR Security, or it's been researched and analyzed and they're in academic papers, or you know, uh, there's a lot of stuff that's out there already that we don't have to invent. We just have to figure out how to make it work uh, with upstream. Um, and there's a large demand for having these kinds of protections in. These, you know, these are the questions people are asking me and other people is like, how do we get these protections in? So that was the start of the kernel self-protection project. Um, we're using mostly this mailing list as, as where we organize. Uh, the second URL is where I announced it and sort of out detailed what we were doing. Um, we have I put together some wiki links to describe a lot of what's in the, these slides about what areas we're focusing on, some uh, the rationale of why we're doing it, how to approach things, uh, stuff like that. But this is mostly all about people interested in either writing the software, doing testing, writing documentation, or just generally discussing the ideas that are going on um, and all sorts of related uh, topics. Um, and uh, there's, there's also people on the same list working on all kinds of user space protections, um, but that doesn't tend to be the focus I'm looking at. I'm looking at just kernel self-protection because it is a narrow, it's a narrow enough scope uh, with so much work to do already uh, that I didn't want to really spend a lot of time working in, on things that the kernel can do to make user space uh, safer since there's already a lot of people working on those things. Uh, it seemed that the self-protection concept didn't have uh, a big driver behind it, um, so I wanted to sort of bring attention to that. Um, and these numbers are getting much harder to actually uh, produce reliably since uh, people will move in and out of working on projects and you know people shift between companies and what technology someone's interested in shifts around but I would say it's about 10 organizations um, working on twice as many technologies um, and the other piece that's important is uh, this is a this is a really slow and steady thing it's not a revolution of change. It's just little pieces slowly making their way in, getting people to understand how they're used, and we will grow from there. Um, it's, uh, it's, not, it's not a fast process. <laughs> so I sort of put together a list of people who've been doing code, doing testing, involved in discussions. Um, if if, uh, if you feel like you're involved in, in the self-protection project and I didn't put your name here, I'm very sorry, my brain doesn't work very well. Um, I just wanted to try and get some uh, list of 
of people and organizations that I could sort of recognize uh, that people have been working on uh, these, the project. Um, if I have you listed under self-funded and I don't know where you work, sorry. If you've moved between companies between when I made this slide, I, I'm sorry, but I just wanted to sort of show that this, you know, this is, uh, there's a lot of people actually paying attention to this, um, which is extremely exciting for me. Uh, I'm glad to have the help because a lot of these areas are extremely technically deep and are not things I know very well myself. So when I can say, hey, we need, we need attention here. Is there anyone who knows this area? <laughs> Please step up, we need this desperately. Um, it's really nice to have a, a pretty deep um, group of people to, to pull from. Um, so to quickly look at bug classes, like to look at areas we're interested in, um, stuff that's in bold, I would sort of say is effectively done for what the protection describes. Um, if I didn't put someone's name near it, generally it's because it happened before the kernel cell protection project uh, got rolling. So we, you know, I can't really take credit for maybe the elevated attention uh, that it's that it's bringing. But um, this is bug class of stack overflows, which is both stack buffer overflow, where you've overflowed the functions allocated stack area and stack exhaustion where you have filled the entire stack segment and you're going past it. Um, one piece right now that Andy uh, Lunomirsky is working on is uh, moving the kernel stack into uh, the vmalloc area so that we can have guard pages um, so we can detect stack exhaustion uh, situations, which also includes the removal of thread info, which is a common target. Um, but there's a couple other areas here that we don't necessarily have anyone paying attention to uh, in upstream. Um, there is this entire bug class of integer overflow and underflow, um, and I have examples of each of these classes as well. Um, we spent some time looking at the PAX ref count, which solves this pretty well. Um, it's, it's being sort of slowly chipped away at. Um, we've got compiler uh, plugin infrastructure now in the kernel, so we can start looking at more of the plugins that exist out of tree. Um, let's see, heap overflows. So this is an examination of, you know, mostly bounds checking of reads and writes of common objects. So a lot of that goes through the copy to user, copy from user infrastructure. Um, and a bunch of people have been helping sort of chip away at the pieces that make up PAX user copy, which actually is uh, composed of about three distinct protections. Um, and we've started to land the first of those three uh, now. And then also looking uh, at sort of metadata validation. You know, if you're adding something to a linked list, you can do very simple checking to see, am I actually in a linked list or have I been corrupted and I'm about to be used for an attack? Um, so some of that's uh, going in as well. Um, we haven't had too many people look at sort of the concept of guard pages uh, around, around heap objects yet. Um, format string injection, another common bug class. Um, removing percent %n, which was the write primitive that exists in format strings, uh, landed in 313. Uh, that was nice, that just changed the entire attack surface from having a potential write primitive to not having a write primitive, so suddenly it's now denial, you know, it's, it's you know, memory exposures, not memory writing, which is significantly nicer. Um, but we can do a lot better with some of our compiler checks on, on format strings. Um, GCC gets very confused about the types of strings that are being used, um, so the built-in protections are not the best, but I think we can improve that uh, with some GCC plugins. Um, leaking, sorry, exposing kernel uh, addresses uh, becomes an issue when you're trying to hide where the kernel is or where targets within the kernel are. Um, so we had this K pointer restrict, which was, it's a little bit too weak in the fact that it requires a developer to know about it and to choose to use it. And that really doesn't meet the bar for what we were designing uh, in the kernel self protection project, which is it should just work. You don't even need to know about it, it should just work. Um, so some of the pieces involved in the PAX user copy in, in the later pieces that we are, are still working on uh, can support examining where are you about to write this kernel address? Is it going to target a buffer that will ultimately end up in user space? Well, then you can't do that. Um, so blocking some of that stuff, uh, we need some folks looking at that as well. Um, and 
while it is the bane of anyone trying to debug a kernel, attempting to remove kernel symbols entirely um, from, from a production build is another option with the, the hide sim stuff. But um, I sort of look at uh, exposures, memory exposures as, as a much harder battle and not necessarily low hanging fruit because you need a, a, a strong way to describe what your threat model is and this one's uh, a little tricky. So I want to save it for later. <laughs> Um, there's a bug class of uninitialized variables. Um, you can actually, you know, land <coughs> exploits. Um, I hadn't seen any good examples of this, so I made one. Um, but there's a couple different methods of clearing out memory so that you end up with fewer exposures uh, and, and you don't have something, you know, in an uninitialized state or an unknown, or, you know, initialized by something else state where anytime you enter you're initializing everything, you know, zeroing out everything, you're cleaning up your stack as you exit. Um, there's a bunch of solutions here. Uh, no one's started to look at this uh, too closely in upstream yet. Um, another one which is usually strongly related with, uh, with integer overflow and underflow is use after free. Um, and again, we've got some, some uh, work done here on uh, clearing out memory after it's been freed so that uh, there are certain classes of attacks uh, aren't, aren't good, um, randomizing, uh, the heap free list can frustrate certain types of attacks. Uh, there's, there's a lot of opportunity here for people to work on more protections on use after free. Um, and then there's finding the kernel at all. Why don't we just move the kernel around? Um, and that's pretty good. We've had, we've had a lot of attention given to uh, kernel base address randomization. Um, work done on x86 recently landed on ARM64 and MIPS, and now we've moved on to randomizing some of the static memory locations, or not static necessarily, but memory locations that are always the same at every boot uh, on x86, is moving stuff like uh, the page tables around, moving the, the vmalloc area around, because there's a lot of uh, very interesting targets in those, in those memory areas uh, that if they're randomized, it, it raises the bar for attack. Um, uh, and then doing um, per build structure layout randomization. So every time you build the kernel, where the target function pointers and everything are actually get moved around. So as, as an attacker, you have to know information about the build, keep track of what version you're looking at. Um, it really uh, frustrates things. And a lot of this stuff is, uh, this is, not a deterministic protection, but it's a, you know, it's, it's a randomization, so uh, it's, it can be gotten around with memory exposures and other things, but it does frustrate a lot of sort of automated attacks. Uh, it makes, it raises the cost of automated attacks. Um, direct kernel overwriting. So if you get a write primitive in the kernel when you're attacking it, you probably shouldn't be able to just write the kernel's uh, you know, code area. This shouldn't be possible. Um, it is still possible on some architectures. Um, I, uh, you know, getting getting this really really well done is uh, is, is strange to me. Like it's the 21st century. This is something that was known how to fix. You know, this has been an idea for decades, um, but it just wasn't a priority because. There's this expectation that, again, oh, well, you can, you can write to the kernel text, that's strange, that must be because there's a bug, let's fix the bug. It's like, no, we need to protect the kernel because there's always a bug. Um, this, this is you know, the simplest way of attacking a, a kernel once you've got a write primitive. Um, so so getting, this, getting this solved for all the architectures uh, would be great. Um, so, so once the kernel is no longer writable, then you have to look at things that are allocated more dynamically, like function pointers. And Julia talked about constifying tables of function pointers. Uh, this is a similar thing. This is making sure that as much of the kernel is read-only as possible means you have very fewer, you know, many fewer places where you can attack as an attacker, uh, assuming the prior page has been taken care of as well. Um, some little pieces to this infrastructure are uh, that while we can do a lot of static and even compile time analysis of things that we never touch, we can trivially make const, uh, the next class of thing in the kernel that is still writable and has these kinds of function pointers are usually written to only during the init phase. 
so we have uh, this, uh, the idea that once init has finished, then you can make all of memory that, uh, that was being written to there read-only again, and it'll continue to run read-only. Uh, so that's this read-only after init piece of the, of the larger, uh, larger idea behind uh, the current exec uh, pieces. And the next step of this is things that are updated only infrequently, you effectively make it writable briefly, write it, and then make it unwritable again so that, you know, sort of by default it's unwritable. Uh, and that's, that's a kind of a, a huge infrastructure change uh, to the kernel. Even doing RO after init took, uh, you know, I had to enlist the help of uh, a couple people and took architectural support in a couple different architectures, um, needed help on making it work on modules, et cetera. And then getting more and more people to use the, this tag, um, which unfortunately is opt-in, but so be it. Um, let me move to exploitation. This is, if you've gained control of the kernel, if you run code that's living in user space, that's by far the easiest mechanism to exploit a kernel. So the idea is if your architecture supports a segregation between you know, privileged memory and unprivileged memory, it should enforce that. Um, and these, you know, this is introduced on a number of different architectures, but I, I can call out x86's SMEP and PXN on ARM and ARM64. Um, but it's possible to emulate this protection in software. Um, and this has been done on ARM now uh, for things that don't have uh, PXN, which is very modern. Um, and then there was a gap on ARM64 where you couldn't use ARM's method of, em of emulation, um, but now it looks like we've got a solution for the ARM v8.0, which is most of ARM64 now. In the future, it'll be hardware segmentation. Um, I still need this on x86, though, so if anyone would like to work on that, um, I'd like that emulation. The next one is user space data. So you didn't run code, but you might be accessing a structure that ends up launching you back into doing bad things in the kernel. So this is, you can't even touch user space memory, memory from the kernel without first saying you want to. Um, this looks very similar. These two pages about the emulation uh, look very similar to each other because ultimately, if you have this protection, you have the prior protection. Um, but again, I still want this on x86 uh, because we've got a long tail of hardware that does not support uh, SMAP on x86. Uh, and it's, this is a, a big deal, like that, that is one of the major ways um, that we're gonna kill m a lot of exploitation methods because this pushes exploitation into finding a place where you can write, write and execute memory in the kernel, uh, which is very small, it should be zero, or you're gonna start generating uh, return-oriented programming style attacks against kernels. So this raises the bar quite, quite a bit by having these kinds, types of protections. Um, which is why I want the emulation as well, because not, you know, not everyone has last year's hardware, um, which gets us to ROP. Um, and at some point, um, we can get to you know, full return-oriented uh, programming protections. Uh, there's been a lot of research done in this. There are some examples in, in PACS. Uh, there's a lot of work being done on you know, uh, control flow integrity, other things like that. Um, we've had pieces, you know, I, I put the, the JIT hardening that was worked on recently here because that's uh, it's similar in that you can, you can instruct the kernel, please create the code I want to attack you with and put it in kernel memory. And the kernel says, okay, and then you run it. And that's not good. So if we can harden that against attacks, remove consts, uh, relocate it, randomize its position, uh, make sure you can't write to it once it's installed, et cetera, those protections have gone in. So to um, quickly reorganize the order of, of these features, I, I like covering the rationale for why things, certain things are getting worked on, um, you know, what, it, what those things provide, what kind of protections they provide, but usually I also get the reverse question is like, okay, so what actually made it into the kernel? So I've turned this around and said, okay, in 4.3, the pan emulation and ARM landed. Um, Ambient capabilities landed, and I'm just uh, marking that as notable. It's a user space protection, but um, it, it changes a lot of how uh, user space can think about uh, operating on capabilities, removes the need frequently for file system capabilities or augments it in a way, um, and seccomp on PowerPC. Um, I'm biased on the seccomp maintainer. Um, 4.4, um, this was a static target in, on x86, could be removed, 4.5. 
Um, again, another user space protection, um, but we were able to control the size of entropy of user space ASLR. Um, 4.x6 got quite a bit of stuff. Um, KSLR on ARM64, RO data uh, was enabled by default, which is what I was talking about for uh, a lot of these. You know, most distro and, and, and vendor products tend to, to turn on RO data already, but to have it on by default is, is good for anyone who's less familiar with what they're building on the kernel. And um, on x86, RO data is now mandatory. It is not possible to turn it off. There are no, there's no config, there are no config if defs anywhere in the code anymore. So you just get proper memory uh, protections on x86. Um, zeroing uh, of, of heap freeze, uh, if you enable the debug mode. Um, the basic infrastructure for RO after init went in, and execute only memory on x86 for processors that no one can get yet uh, landed. <laughs> but it's there, so once someday we get that, that'll be nice. Um, and that's more about uh, memory exposures. So if you get a read primitive, you can't read out the entire kernel and find your attack targets and other things. So if you can only execute it, that makes your life more difficult as an attacker. 4.7, uh, KSLR for MIPS, um, slab free list randomization, uh, the JIT constant blinding landed. Um, 4.8, we got the slub free list randomization. Um, KSLR on x86 was expanded to cover the entire physical memory range instead of just the first uh, couple gigs. Uh, and the work has started on randomizing the, the various memory bases uh, in the kernel on x86. The GCC plugin infrastructure uh, finally made its way in uh, with a couple example plugins that don't really have too much security relevance yet, but um, those were, it was kind of an invasive series of changes, so to have the infrastructure in place means it's now uh, trivially, pos trivially possible to add GCC plugins. You can you know, pluck them out of PAX and GR security and run them on a mainline kernel now, uh, which is quite nice, although usually for many of the, the PAX and GR security plugins, you'll also need a bunch of annotation from the kernel as well, so it's not totally trivial, but to have the infrastructure in place is, is pretty important. Um, we have the first step of some user copy hardening, and another attack surface reduction thing is now there was a hole with seccomp, it was sort of intentional hole, um, with ptrace. You had a seccomp filter, you could bypass it with ptrace. I'll talk more about that tomorrow, um, but that's been fixed. And then my magic crystal ball predictions because who knows? Um, hopefully the latent entropy GCC plugin will go in and that, that's designed to get us more, you know, like sort of un, uh, more, more state in the random number generator for usually embedded devices or things that don't have good hardware um, random number generators. Uh, the vmalloc stack on x86. Um, list hardening that I talked about will uh, land in there, and it looks like pan emulation for ARM64, which I'm extremely excited about, uh, should be in, hopefully in 4.9 as well. But again, I can never predict what's gonna go in. Um, and I quickly cover the distinct challenges. Uh, the, probably the biggest challenge is culture uh, on both sides of sort of the fence of out of tree and upstream. Uh, there's a lot here. The upstream, there's quite a bit of conservatism on on code changes. Um, the example I like to give is that uh, it's a user space protection, but still it, it's uh, indicative of the, of the problem, um, is the idea of symlink restrictions in temp. So these temp races on symlinks, which has been you know, plagued Linux and Unixy systems forever, a very simple, clean solution was designed you know, 16 years prior to it actually landing in the upstream kernel, and there were five or six people that made attempts over the decade and a half to get that in. Um, and it really takes uh, a lot of persistence and patience. Um, so on top of that, uh, you know, there's, I feel like uh, a lot of the upstream developers need to sort of accept the responsibility of like, okay, we do need to pay attention to this, this is important. Um, and we have to accept that it's gonna be, uh, it's gonna take work and we're gonna have to deal with the technical burden. Um, and then for the people who are trying to get this stuff in, you need to get a lot more patience and understand how the kernel is developed and that it's not an instantaneous change and that things are evolutionary in, in their process. Um, and of course, we have the technical challenge. A lot of these protections are incredibly complex um, and so they are even harder to debug. <laughs> um, and there's a lot of innovation involved. You know, things that exist already in the world are not necessarily suited for, for what's, uh, how upstream does its work. Um, 
and you know, there's collaboration uh, on these changes is a big deal. You know, even if you have fantastic code, if you can't describe why it's needed, how it helps things, why it does what it does, um, you know, really documenting these changes is uh, can be a big challenge. And understanding that developing against upstream means you're not writing code for the kernel, you're writing code for the kernel developers. And other people are maintaining your code, other people need to understand your code, and other people are not necessarily familiar with what you're doing. So, um, you know, having stuff really understandable to other people that don't know this is, is pretty critical. Um, and, of course, resources, getting more people to help. So if your company is interested in it, if you are interested in it, um, getting dedicated people uh, on this and getting dedicated testers, which, is, which has been incredibly handy. You know, even if you're not you know, big into writing really complex uh, technical things like this, just taking a patch set, running it on the hardware you have and saying, hey, this works for me, or you're a moron, you forgot this corner case and it blew up, here's my dump, please fix it. Um, that's incredibly handy. Like getting that, silence is by far the worst thing on any upstream development. So if you post a patch series and you see something you're like, oh yeah, I should, I should really download that and try that, uh, that's, that's really important. And then ultimately, um, we're gonna have to recognize that a, another major contribution of this is vendors will have released products that have old kernels. So getting people to do backports of potentially complex and invasive changes and backport them uh, is gonna be uh, another big area of work. Um, and that was a lot of slides, and I'm done. So um, that's where you can get, look at the wiki, that's the list, that's the slides. I'm not sure how much time I have, but um, if there are any questions, I can try to take them now. Yes? I didn't hear the last part of that. An example of what? Uh, sure, so um, let's see, the, um, I think probably a, a quick example that's recent is uh, this move to move, uh, move the kernel stack uh, onto vmalloc um, introduces limitations on, uh, I mean, there, you're, you weren't supposed to do it before, but it did function. If you were to use a stack buffer as a target for DMA. Um, it really doesn't work on vmalloc, um, so it requires uh, it requires changing the infrastructure of drivers that may be performing those kinds of things. Um, so that that's sort of a one-time cost. Um, a ongoing maintenance burden might be if we get uh, emulation of of the this memory segregation. The infrastructure for that tends to be pretty invasive on per CPU, on page tables, on a bunch of other things, and it complicates how those layouts work and how the code works and how task switching occurs. Actually, the um, case yeah. Is, that's not a, the the one is not a good example. Okay. It actually has a good use outside security. Oh yeah. Because we have a page fragmentation problem. Right. Yeah. It's just that it accidentally worked Exactly. It's maybe not the best example, but uh, but um, the com usually it's complexity that's being introduced. Um, Size of work. Yeah. But it does give a good example of how you get security patches up there. They have limited uses. Oh, yeah. Other people can advocate for much weakness. Yeah, it's, it's easy to get a security, fic or a security feature in when it has additional benefits. <laughs> this is not always true, um, but that's uh, the, the vmalloc stacks is a good example of that, um, of debuggability and a couple other things. I think I saw you first. Um, one thing is that wasn't quite mentioned there is that sometimes these security fixes have a performance impact, and what's been the challenges in getting those kinds of things in? Um, so, I have tried uh, cowardly enough to uh, to avoid that as much as possible by hiding things behind config values, uh, so that um, we I, I use 
I, I sort of use the time frame of introducing a feature that may have some performance impact, but placating people by saying, okay, it's behind a config, so only people who are interested in it will use it. And then in a year or two, when every single distro and every major vendor of Linux has turned this config on, I can turn around later and say, look, this needs to be default yes, because it's already default yes for the world in reality. Um, so I, I'm, I sort of try to avoid that fight because it's an incredibly hard fight to have. I simply have to say, okay, if it's worth it, then everyone else in the world interested in it will turn it on and we can prove that out later. So I've sort of been collecting this long list of configs that I'd like to have config yes, but it's like that's not a battle I want to have right now. <laughs> So we should wrap this up with um, into the next. I'll be around in the breaks. People come see me, ask questions. Um, thank you. Thanks, Dave. <laughs>